Welcome to The Mountain Gardener with your host, Ken Lane. Gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and local advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome your host, Ken Lane. And welcome to this week's edition of The Mountain Gardener. Your host, Ken Lane, every every week. Been doing this for many, many years, more than maybe a couple decades. That's a long time. We just share what what's going on, some garden content on a timely basis for the mountains of Arizona. This is a little bubble in the southwest that is, we do things the opposite of everywhere else, uh, at, least, at least those neighbors around us. And so from the, from the west, California, it's more tropical, Palm Springs, desert, uh, Phoenix, Tucson, just all that garden info you're getting there, it does not translate up to the higher elevations of Arizona. In fact, everything you you learned there kind of just erase, reboot, and start over because it's just the timing mainly is what you're what you're what's different here. And the plant mix, we're surrounded by pine and juniper forest, manzanitas. Uh, we have we grow lots of fruit trees, but not not the ones that grow there. We grow fruit trees that grow at higher elevations. Some of them thrive here. The apples and the pears, the nectarines and cherries and you can go on and on if you get the right variety so you want things that bloom real late in spring so they wake up so we're out of the risk of frost that's different than other parts of the country mainly too our our soil and our water are uniquely horrible so you're reading right now all the seed catalogs are coming in bulbs catalogs shoot we're even getting swimsuit issues here not gardening wouldn't that be fun Gardening in a swimsuit. Okay, there we go. We got a new trend. Uh, anyway, you're seeing that spring is definitely in the air just with the messages that are coming through our, our net and through the magazines, through, 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 our, through our news sources. Um, you do not want to do certain things you did in the Midwest. So there they say add lime to your soil. Lime will sweeten your soil. It'll make everything bloom better. Everything will taste more fragrance. If you do that here in the Southwest, you'll kill your plants. They'll go yellow. They'll drop their 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 flowers. Uh, they'll drop their needles. They're just going to be, they're, they'll, they'll look emaciated. Our water is so alkaline and, and lime is made to raise the pH. So if you're in an area that has really acidic soil, that's a great thing to do. But that's not here. You got to be really careful where you curate the news that you're getting, the, the garden advice that you're you're responding to or, or seen as, as as professional. Well, if it's from the East Coast, that does not work. Not all of it works here. Some of the same plants grow here, but how you treat them and when you plant them is totally different. So that if you're new to the area, I would say really do your homework. Before you just jump in, do a little Google search and and pile in, going, oh, that sounds good. Let's go for it. Uh, really, do your homework or or know what what when to do things. So I've seen so many mistakes. So fruit trees are coming in this week. People just go, I know fruit trees. I'm going to plant an apples and apples and apple. That is not true. A cherry is a cherry. An apricot's an apricot. That is not true. There's some that are desert varieties, and there's some that that thrive better in clay soils. There's some that do better in windy locations, and so you need to find the varieties that have proven themselves in the area that you're gardening. I would say it's all about elevation. The higher elevation you get to, the more frost and cold there is, the more wind you're exposed to, and the more you really have to to do your homework. The second would be this pollination. Not all varieties. You can't just plant any pear you want. Or it won't produce. Yeah, they'll both grow. A uh, pear doesn't grow by itself, typically. It needs a buddy to cross-pollinate it and a different variety. You need to get that matchup right or you'll have these beautiful trees that never produce fruit. And so I've, the horror stories, the, the number of times I've heard, oh, I planted this this cherry tree, this this peach, this this nut last year, a walnut or an almond last year, and it's never produced fruit. Why, Ken? Why? 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 Well, it's probably coming down to a wrong variety for the mountains, and it just blooms either way too early or you don't have a pollinator for it. You need to get those things right. And so if you're new to the area, really be careful. If you're from the desert, all those plants you knew do not grow up here. Just 
flat out. Maybe there's, t- okay, pyracanther grows anywhere. Uh, Russian sage grows anywhere. But but those bougainvilleas, they're not going to grow up here. I mean, unless you have them inside as a houseplant. Citrus, you're not going to grow grapefruits and tangerines and lemons and limes. You, none will grow up here. They'll go down to about mid-20 degrees, and then they just vaporize and die. Uh, the other big mistake new folks, I find, make, they're new, they're from the East Coast, they're from other areas where they've been fantasizing about the desert. Oh, I love all those great agaves and cacti. Oh, I can't wait to paint my house turquoise blue and my shutters green. It's going to be great. Everything's going to be tan, 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 and variations of beige. It's going to be a beautiful thing. I'm going to plant cactus. Everywhere's going to be cactus. I'm going to have swarrows and that, that that's, that's Phoenix. That's not up here. As soon as you get up to, to Coyote Springs, uh, to, to Paulden, really Cordes Junction, Spring Valley, once you make that grade up the I-10, those that's out. It's over. We got variations of cacti that are prickly pears, maybe choyas or jumping cactus, maybe some little, uh, uh, there's some little hedgehog kind of things, but it's really, really limited. The amount of number of people that I find go to Phoenix, buy the cactus, bring it up the hill, they plant it, it thrives through the summer, and the winter, it dies. If that happened to you this winter, they turn to black mush is what's happened. Most cacti have no antifreeze in them. They can take, they can take down to 32 degrees. Really, they don't like to be below 45 degrees. Once they go below that, they just go, I'm cold. I'm cold, so cold. I'm going to die. If you don't protect me, I'm going to die. And they do. They turn to black mush. So they just freeze and die. So they get basically frostburn, uh, like you'd get in your fingers climbing Mount Everest. They get fri- frostburn their entire body, and there's no recovery from that. There's, they're not going to come back for you. So then you got to go back and really focus more on the yuccas. There's quite a few yuccas that grow up here. Not all. But many that, that look good. Succulents. So lots of different types of succulents will grow really well up here, from uh, stone crops to creeping, you know, blood good, really rich, beautiful, evergreen succulents that kind of have that feel of cacti, but they aren't. There's no needles to them. And then agaves. So from your peri eyes, the big, big uh, artichoke agaves to the utagensis, the one that grows up on the rim of the Grand Canyon, all of those thrive here. They're not cacti, but they can give you that look. So you need to change. You really do your homework before you jump all in and commit you know, $1,000 worth of landscape and it dies come winter. Or it never blooms at the right time so you never get fruit. Really be careful. Do your homework. Uh, know the sources. So in Flagstaff, you really want to go to Warner's Nursery. They know their stuff. Viola's are pretty good. You got uh, Payson. You got Plant Fair. They're all friends. Uh, White Mountains, Christopher Gardens. Here in Prescott, I would say this the Central Highlands area here here around Yavapai County, come to Waters Garden Center. We know families have been growing farming here for decades. It's going to be year 58. This will be our 58th spring. We've had many farms throughout the county, uh, several garden centers. We've had landscape companies that planted all throughout the county. Who's going to know better? for your town than, than going directly to the source that knows, rather than Google. I mean, verify and search more from the net, from your phone, whatever, but then I would say start. It's good to, to take a tour and do some recon and, and get a feel for what's what are the things that I like that are at the garden center right now, and those are the things will tr- that will translate, that will plant in your yard. And I would not say that about a box store. So their, their buyer says, send 50 of those to all of my stores from Tucson to Flagstaff, and all of them get 50. And that may or may not grow at, at where you're at. So, so I've seen some strange things. Just, just verify. I mean, believe, then verify, right? So there we go. Lots of garden, great tips coming in for you, how to prep soils, fruit trees, and, and more right after this. You've been listening to The Mountain Gardener with Ken Lane, owner of Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Join him every week for timely garden advice right for the gardens. Visit Ken where he can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. It's almost spring. Time to grow a pear. A pear tree, that is. 
Late winter is ideal for planting fruit trees. At Waters Garden Center has cherry-picked the hardiest, heaviest producing trees from our most trusted growers. From apples to apricots and persimmons to pears, the garden center is plum full of varieties that thrive in our mountain soil. And we'll even plant them for you. We believe life is a bowl of cherries, so grow the best ones ever. From Waters Garden Center in Prescott. If life is a bowl of cherries, why not make them the biggest, sweetest cherries ever? Waters Garden Center is super excited to introduce our new organic fruit and vegetable plant food. This fertilizer has the bonus of added calcium that gives fruit trees and veggies an extra boost to produce healthy, abundant crops. Feed your plants now to help them thrive and grow more fruits than ever in just $27 for a 20-pound bag. Safe, natural, organic fruit and vegetable plant food only at Waters Garden Center. You've been listening to Ken Lane, the Mountain Gardener. Green thumbs learned while working in the Family Garden Center. Now welcome back to the Mountain Gardener. All right, so we are in the studio with Lisa Waters Lane. She comes each week and answers your garden questions. So Lisa's here. Uh, it has been one ride. Spring has officially started at the garden center. So the yes. team has been in the back of semis all week, it seems like. <laughs> so they've been unloading what, fruit trees, make yep. the, the beautiful pansy containers. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of the shrubs, the shrubs uh, butterfly are bush. In. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of fun. Spring is starting. I noticed too that in the garden center, the uh, camellias, they opened this week. So they're yes. in bloom. Not not the whole thing covered. I mean, a camellia, a hardy variety, grows mm-hmm. up here in the mountains. And it'll have 50 buds on it. Mm-hmm. So maybe, you know, five or six have opened, but that's enough for a, for a gardener. So they're I Instagrammed big those. They're, they're huge. What, three, four inches? Yeah, Cross? as big yeah. as a Rosa Sharon or the, sure. that hardy hibiscus, mm-hmm. absolutely. And then I notice, if you look real close, the manzanita yeah. have started to bloom. Those little bell-shaped mm-hmm. uh, flowers. You know, They've been evergreen all winter, and now they just decided, eh, it's time. And the bees are foraging around trying to find something mm-hmm. to eat, so they're up. So it, you know, yeah. it's, it's classic spring <laughs> in the mountains of Arizona. Warm today. Cold tomorrow, then warm again, then then cold again, then warm yep. again. I noticed our neighbor across the street, they have a winter jasmine in their yard, which is probably one of the very first things that blooms here. And it's in bloom. Yeah. So that's how you know spring is coming. Yeah, last year that happened ours because we have a winter jasmine in the backyard oh, by that's the gate. Right. I forget we have that. It started blooming. <clears throat> and then we had 18 inches of snow <laughs> in the yard. So you just that's the way it is. So Don't for you new that. folks. I'm already having people asking for like tomatoes. I just want to slap them sometimes. Going, you're you're way too early. Just yeah. like it's Mother's Day. You're four months early, but they just don't know they get yet. Excited. So it felt, or they've yeah. moved from other areas yeah. where they start them. Or Phoenix, yeah. you'd be getting close to starting That's your right. tomatoes. So. so just it'll be. Well, I think we'll bring in a few in March. Very limited. For those that have greenhouses or, or a garage, Arizona rooms or, or they want to, yeah. yeah. yeah the, the bulk of them, though, will be a month later, in mm-hmm. the middle, the end of April. That's when right. most of it, the summer planted stuff is, goes in then. Right. Right now, the spring planted things are planted now. So that's the fruit trees and mm-hmm. and uh, the, the lilacs and forsythias and butterfly right. bush. You can just go on and on and on. You can plant now. Mm-hmm. You just got to be careful what you're planting. So pansies. Did you see that ivy uh, cache? Yes, I ordered those. They sounded so pretty. I'm like, ooh, that sounds cool. I'm getting those. English ivies Mm -hmm. surround in a pot on a tower, surrounded by pansies. You can just take one home and plop it by your front door and go. Oh, did you say I could just take one home? Well, I'm sure you'll do whatever you want (laughs) anyway. Of course I will. Like when? When did I have a choice in that? I'm just verifying that you said, letting it publicly be known. You said. Well, honey, I would suggest that you should probably bring. Two home. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Does that make you feel better? Sure. Makes me feel better. <laughs> anyway, we should go to garden questions before we digress into marital uh, uh, bliss. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go to questions. So our first question is from Jerry. He would like to know if he can start pruning his fruit trees now. And then also, he can't remember, but he thinks there's something he's supposed to spray on him when he yeah. gets done. Yeah, that's good. They were listening, just not taking notes. That's good. <laughs> 
So yes, prune fruit trees. You've got plenty of time. I would say get it done by the end of February, middle of March. So you got four, five, six weeks. When you get all done pruning, then you spray it. This is going back to his mm -hmm. question with horticultural dormant oil, or horticultural spray. It's a light grade oil. It's organic. And it's a, the safest, least expensive, most effective thing you can use on your fruit trees in the yard. I would spray the entire yard. Get a hose and sprayer, but but really focus on those fruit trees because coddly moth, there's there's some borers that get in there. Well, what that oil does, it coats the plant, the bark areas, mm -hmm. and it, it kind of smothers eggs that were laid last winter. So you'll start your, your gardens fresh without aphids, without thrip, without borers, without... You know, all these things that will wake up, hatch, and then start to attack that plant, it just cleans everything up. They can still fly in at you, but at least you won't be having issues right out, coming from your own Start property, with. your own trees. Yeah. So I would spray roses. Mm -hmm. uh, what else? Little like pinion pines, things like that. Pinion pines, it can help. Really, that's a scale. It's a little okay. bit different. It can thin the numbers, but really, there's something better mm -hmm. for pinion pine scale. I'm sure when when they start to hatch, we'll have an announcement. We'll go over how to do that. Okay. It's a little bit early to go up, but yeah, if you got it and it's in there, it, I mean, I think can't it's, hurt. It's twenty dollars for a quart of oil, concentrated, and it goes like gallons and gallons. Mm -hmm. It's just really efficient use. Would you spray the soil surrounding your trees, or just mainly the trunks and the branches? Yeah, that kind of thing. that's a good question. Uh, thrip, aphids, ciliads, all these bugs that come out early spring, they winter over in the leaf litter down at the base of the tree. Uh -huh. So, or or in the cracks mm -hmm. of the bark that they're in the main crotches. So, focus on the main crotches, that big barky area, and at the base of that plant, that tree, that shrub, that. Yes, absolutely. It can't hurt. It can only help. And you just never know what's down there. I've literally <laughs> opened up that leaf litter up below a plant and seen the ground started to crawl. Yeah. It started to move. It gets spooky. I mean, yes. you could have nightmares about that. So, yes, spray <laughs> them. Okay. Our next question is from Kate. She needs to transplant a fairly large lilac. She wants to know, should she do it now? And then her second question is, should she prune it back before moving it? Oh yeah, that if you got to move it, move it. So yeah, it's uh, if it's a really big one, it'll be high risk, mm -hmm. and you do want to do it while it's still dormant before it leaves out or flowers. So now, they're going to bloom usually the first part of April, end of March, sometime. It just depends on our weather. So you definitely want to get it done moved before that. Now, here's what the book says. This is what the horticultural experts say. Cut the plant back in foliage mass by a third. So really cut whack on it. Really take it back. What you're trying to do is when you move, when you dig that thing up, you're going you're gonna to cut a lot of roots. So there isn't as many roots to support the top growth that was there. So we really want to cut back the foliage mass so that the roots that are left can support that remaining foliage. Unfortunately, it won't bloom this year. So that that's the negative, but it will it will stay alive. And so, move it. We've got a handout here. You probably ought to ask for it. It's really helpful. It tells you what size hole, how much mulch, some so a food that helps helps it wake up, and then mainly a, a root and grow transplant shock. It's something we make here. It's a special composted tea that really helps that plant start to form out new roots. You'll definitely want some of that. If you're going to move a major plant, anytime you transplant mm -hmm. uh, a new plant from a bucket to the ground, that's what it's made for. But even more so when it's from the ground, been rooting for several years, and now you're going to move it again, really important. But it's, it's called our Waters Planting Guide. They're free. Please ask for it. Okay. I think we have time for one more. So uh, is there a reason, Lindsay would like to know, is there any reason she shouldn't use her neighbor's horse manure in her garden beds? Yeah, it's good stuff. The negative with horse manure. So we're surrounded by horse country. Mm -hmm. There's horses everywhere. There's free manure as unlimited amount. <laughs> uh, the negative with horse manure is what they eat comes out the other end, and it's not composted. So the, you'll get alfalfa and barley and hay and straw. Uh -huh. All those seed go through their system, and, and a horse goes... It doesn't digest it, and so it comes out. So you'll get barley and hay and all these things coming up unless you compost it 
first. Mm -hmm. So if you, you mount it and age it for six, nine, 12 months, so really you're you're taking the, the manure now and using it next year, mm -hmm. so you can compost it to kill those seed. The other negative is uh, there's a grub that really loves manure. It's a huge thing. It's a horned, a be it's a beetle that lays her eggs in manure, and the grub is like four, five, six inches long they're frightening <laughs> they're like an alien life form landed from mars and they eat the living daylights out of the roots of your plants so you really want to dig through manure first even composted mm -hmm. stuff and see if you see those grubs if you don't you're good if you do you want to screen them out or use some diatomaceous earth or something right. to help thin those the big rookie mistake is they take this manure it's raw Throw it in their gardens. It's got grubs, seed. It's high in salts. And so don't use raw manure. Use composted manure. Okay. And it's a great source of nitrogen, phosphorus. Great, great stuff. Great questions this week, folks. Ken and Lisa Lane and the Mountain Gardeners. We'll be right back. You're listening to Ken Lane, a.k.a. the Mountain Gardener. Ken can be found throughout the week in Prescott at Waters Garden Center. Listen each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to mountain gardens. Hi, Ken, with the plant of the week and our cherry jolt, Dianthus. Jumpstart the color in the garden with a generous helping of this jolting Dianthus. The cherry fragrant flowers come atop rich green foliage. A sun worshiper through and through, growing 12 inches, and knows how to draw the butterflies to their nectar-laden flowers. Uniquely waters and just $11. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road, where people who love flowers that jolt, they love to shop. Hi, Lisa with the plants of the week and our Goshiki Holly. Goshiki translates from Japanese as holly with five colors. Its new leaves emerge red, then turn green. The entire top of this holly is draped in colors of cream, white, gray, yellow, and green. This evergreen makes the perfect accent, hedge, or evergreen container for its all-round good looks. A really nice plant that shines through winter is just $39. Waters Garden Center, where people who love Japanese gardens, they love to shop. You've been listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Join the conversation every week as he answers timely garden questions. Email Ken a question directly from your phone to his desktop through the web at watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. Now welcome back your host, Ken Lane. So I wrote a garden column this week on how to prepare your soil. And so I thought I'd just share that real quick. It's, it's not complicated. There's a few steps. But if you don't amend your garden soils each year, whether for flowers, roses, uh, vegetables, uh, you, you'll find that your production quickly fades. And your soil level, you'll actually see soil disappear. I don't know where it goes, but you'll just see it. You've got a raised bed, and it's got a 10 by 10 area, and it's an inch, the soil's an inch shorter than it was last year. It didn't blow away. The plants actually used it. Uh, this is ex especially important in containers. If you've got container gardens, like we've got over 50 containers, that's big, large pots from trees to roses to herbs, vegetables we grow in containers. And they're pretty right now. Lots of pansies and snapdragons started to bloom. Uh, I've, I've got uh, uh, jasmines that are evergreen. They just, they'll bloom here in another two months. And just it's just pretty. With the, can, the pots that I grow, tomatoes and peppers, eggplants I grew last year, those containers, I want to add some freshness to my pots. And so I always start there. And I've already done this work already. I'll take the top half of that soil for larger pots. Let's say it's 20 inches across and 20 inches high. It's a pretty substantial pot. I could grow a tomato or, or two. Sometimes I, I think I grew four eggplants in one big pot last year. And so there I want to take... The area where all those old roots are, I want to take those things out, screen it out, throw away the old roots, because as they compost in the soil, they're dead from last year, they're going to compost, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll rob my plants of nitrogen. So I want to get them, filter them out. And so what's left over is kind of dead soil, it's not that good. So I want to add some fresh potting soil to those pots. It's made specifically for containers. And so a good potting soil, it, it drains, but it has, but it stays moist. It's got or lots of organics in it, organic fertilizer. We put a 555 organic fertilizer in our potting soil. It's our grower's mix. So I want to add some of that in those pots, especially the top half. 
where the new roots are going to grow. And so if a plant, if you put a, if you put a, a fresh new pepper plant, or jalapeno, whatever, poblano, into, into, a, into a new container, if you can give it the same exact soil it was grow, that it was grown in and just give it more of that same kind of soil in a pot, oh, it's just going to take off and ignite with new growth. It's going, oh, I can, find, I can expand. I'm just going to grow. Look how happy I'm going to be. It just goes. The other areas, that, that top layer of the used soil from last year, I take that soil and I add it to my raised beds. So there it's more forgiveness out there. There I will add that, I top off my regular containers with potting soil, and I'm going to focus on those raised beds. There I want to add some manure. So usually I'll take that old potting soil plus a 50-50 uh, uh, blend of manure, barnyard manure, and composted mulch. So I'll put a two-inch layer, and I'll till that in one shovel's depth. That's what I do myself. That's the process. That's the thinking from this gardener. Hopefully you can get something out of this. And so I'm, I'm blending manure, barnyard manure, also manure. Oh, some of it's so gooey and gross and stinky. It just, you feel dirty just looking at the bag. We have a barnyard manure that's deodorized. So it looks like compost. It doesn't stink. And your hands are not going to get gooey and dirty. It's just, it's just nice. I felt embarrassed putting you know, $1.99, three, three, $4 bags of manure, and it was gooey in the back of a Lexus or Mercedes or whatever nice high-end car it is. You know what? I don't want to stink your car up. So I came up with a deodorized one that's got a blend of different kinds of, of manures. It doesn't have just chicken or turkey manure. It's super hot. It doesn't have just cow that's all gooey. It's, we blended it together and then it's deodorized. Anyway, put that down. Now, before I turn that in with a shovel, typically, I'm going to add my nutrients at the same time to that. Now, for me, I'm growing vegetables and some flowers. Mainly vegetable gardens is where I'm focused on. There I'll add some gypsum, sulfur, and vegetable food. Those are the three things I add on to that. So here's why. Uh, we're notorious for having blossom end rot. So that's where the, where the blossom was sitting on a tomato, a pepper, an eggplant, a, a squash. Uh, the fruit rots. It gets a black spot. It's called blossom end rot. It's almost always a calcium deficiency. Well, gypsum is calcium sulfate. So I want to add that to my vegetable areas so I don't have any or, or as much blossom end rot. Sulfur I add to the garden because our water is so incredibly alkaline. I want to counteract that. I don't add, I, I, I don't add lime to the soil like everyone else says in the country. I do just the opposite because our water is alkaline, not acidic. So I want to bring that pH down as best I can, and sulfur is your best additive for that. And then, then lastly, you want to put a nutrient. So there's an organic vegetable food I made years ago, and you put that in. And I'm going to blend those three things together with the mulch and the manure down to one shovel's depth, and I am ready to plant with that recipe. So manure, mulch, gypsum, sulfur, and a food. You blend it to one shovel's depth. You let it sit for a couple of weeks. If you don't want it, if you're getting a little late and you want it ready to plant just right now, water it in really good. Put, run your irrigation system. You want to flush out, balance out all that mixture before you start plugging new seedlings in there. But we've already got spinach and kale and Swiss chard. You can start planting as soon as you get your soil there. But I would let it settle for a couple weeks and then start planting. By March 1, you're full on spring. You can start planting onions and garlics, the whole potatoes, the whole shoot match. So it's time to prepare those garden soils now. The Mountain Gardener, your source for timely garden advice right for higher elevations. Guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Hi, Ken here with the Plants of the Week and our McMinn Manzanita. Part of water's expanding native selection, this is the big, bold manzanita you find growing throughout Arizona. A local evergreen growing wild with the classic red bark for a style and drought-hardy landscape. Locally grown for local landscapes, this Easy Care shrub is just $39. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love lots of native plants, they love to shop. 
Once upon a time, Fred the Sage and Bob the Yucca watched a herd of deer eat their neighbor's garden. Hey, Bob, said Fred. It's a good thing we're native Arizona plants from Waters Garden Center. Right, Fred, said Bob. We can handle tough Prescott dirt, hot sun, low water, and we look great in the garden. You betcha, Bob, said Fred. Hummingbirds and bees love us, but that deer sure doesn't. Be like Fred and Bob. Go native at Waters Garden Center. Safe, natural, and organic. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert, Ken Lane. Mountain gardening is very rewarding, with a few of Ken's tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts sure to turn your thumbs even greener. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. And we are back in the studio with Lisa Waters Lane. She comes each week with your garden... Well, Garden Wise is going to go back to segment two, but this is all about you. Wake There's up, no Ken. questions Wake at all. <laughs> Mental lapse. <laughs> Where are we at the show? <laughs> We're going to start over. Reboot. Go over again. Anyway, Lisa comes and just shares her epiphanies of the garden. Epiphanies. We should retitle the... the uh, Lisa's epiphanies. Of the gardens. Uh-huh. <laughs> then like butterflies. It. should We should make a, a gif of that. Should butterflies a, should come out of your, yeah. your hat or your sound ears. Sound effects with little... Ding! Ding! <laughs> I don't know about that one. That's a butterfly? (laughs) Anyway. Okay. So what kind of garden thoughts do you have for us this week? Well, this week I'm going to talk about fruit trees. Right, Propos. You had, I don't know, like a hundred or more fruit trees show up. showing up. We have a bunch more coming. Yeah. But fruit tree, a lot of people um, maybe don't necessarily think about fruit trees in their landscape. But they can provide a lot of benefits for your landscape. First off. Like avocados? No. Citrus? No. Oh. But other stuff. So they give you beautiful blossoms. So most of your fruit trees really have spectacular blossoms on them, from white to dark pink. Some of the peaches have almost a red color to them. So it can give you some really pretty spring color. It also gives you fruit, you hope, most years, fruit. Uh, so that's a side benefit, and it also helps the birds and that kind of stuff, because they always get a little bit of it as well. And then it helps with your pollinators, because that draws pollinators into the yard. Also provides shade in your yard. If you have a south side or a west side that needs some shade, put a fruit tree in there. They usually have a really nice structure to them and, and are pretty hardy trees. I have a buddy of mine who went to, we went to school together, so we were all classmates. Prescott High School, go Badgers. Class up, we won't say because that'll date us. Uh, no, no, don't even okay. go there. So, yeah. Anyway, he's got a fruit tree in the front, but what he does, he and his wife, they can't use all the fruit. Sure. It just produces bushels and bushels. It's very, they're very happy with it. Because mm-hmm. all the rest, he puts a fruit picker and leans it up against a tree. Ah. And he prints out recipes of their favorite <laughs> apple pie or whatever. Yeah. And some bags, and he goes, Feel free to pick as many as you oh, like. Nice. Uh, this is a neighborly thing. Mm-hmm. Here you go. And that, then they pick all the rest of them. They get yeah. their, their what they want. And then sure. the neighbors get the rest. Went, that is a brilliant I idea. I love that idea. Yeah. Great for community. Yeah. Great. That's just a great idea. Yeah. I know there's in our neighborhood, there's actually several people that have fruit trees. Yeah, quite a number. Um, and, and we've occasionally. Walk by and snack <laughs> if they're not home. They haven't been there. It's their second home. Yeah. We had one neighbor that was gone for a long time. We always used to go and, and take her cherries, and then she moved back in. And Dang we it. talked about it one time, and next thing I knew, there was a little bag of cherries on my front porch. Oh, floor. that's awesome. Isn't that nice? <laughs> yep. Neighbors are good. I love neighbors. Are good. Yep. So, yeah, we can use fruit trees to bring communities together. Well, but you didn't want to go there, but just. <laughs> into mind because I just talked to him about no, this. No, I like know? it. I like that concept. So great for shade as well and to just structure in your yard. Too many landscapes here are so one level. Yeah, it drives me true. bonkers. We need some different heights and shapes in our yards and fruit trees can definitely help you with that. I mean, I mean taller than a boulder <laughs> or your rock lawn or yeah. We it's won't, we won't go there right now. So essentially there's four different sizes of fruit trees. So there's standard, which a standard fruit tree, would you say 20 feet? Yeah, 20, 20, 20 to 30, depends on yeah. the variety. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the pitted fruits like peaches and apricots and nectarines, those are going to be in that lower elevation, lower right. height. Mm-hmm. The bigger ones are going to be your apples and pears. They can get up into that 30 right. range with some age. Right, yeah. So that's what your grandparents always grew, sure. standard size mm-hmm. fruit trees. Right. So those are great 
if you're looking for shade in the yard. And also, if you want to be able to walk under it, yeah. get a standard because that way you can prune it up so that you can walk under it or yeah. put a nice bench under it or your picnic table, whatever. Semi dwarf would be probably 12 to 15 feet, would you say? Yeah, mid teens. Mm -hmm. Just think 30% smaller than a standard one. Mm -hmm. So if it's usually 20, it'll be you know, 14. If it's usually right. 30, it'll be you know, 18 and 20, somewhere in there. So it's it's a, it's still a full-size tree, but just a mm -hmm. quick step down so they're easier to pick and maintain. Right. So for those smaller landscapes, great. Yeah. Also, if you want to grow in containers. True. That would be yeah. a great one for containers. So that semi-dwarf. The next is the dwarf, which six to eight feet probably. Yeah. Uh, you see that a lot in your peach trees and nectarines and that type of thing. And that's another great one to grow in containers. Yeah. Also great if you have just a balcony or a really small like patio home yard and you yeah. just don't have a lot of room. Those are terrific for it. And because they're, a lot of people start thinking, oh, dwarf, it must have small fruit. No, the fruit is normal size. Yeah. They've just taken that and they've grafted onto rootstock that just doesn't get very big. Yeah, the fruit size is the same no matter what variety, not, well, not variety, but what uh, standard semi-dwarf, mm -hmm. dwarf, no matter what the genetics, uh, how they dwarfed it, the fruit is the same every time. Right. Now, the quantity of fruit will be different because, you know, more well, foliage yeah. mass equals more fruit. So sure. if you want bushels and bushels, the bigger the tree, the more the fruit. Mm -hmm. uh, the smaller the tree, you have a few less fruits because there's just not as much branch structure right. to hold the fruit. Right. And I guess, and I did not know this, they make a super dwarf, super dwarf. fruit tree. Wow. And I can say I've never seen one. Yeah. And they didn't have a lot of detail on what varieties would be super dwarf. So You are a tease. You're just broadcasting <laughs> this out. Everyone's listened in, and there you're just going, here's something that's also out there that you can't have because I've have never it. seen it either. I'm thinking, what do you need smaller than a dwarf? I mean, really, come on. I mean, Do you yeah. need Chest something high, smaller yeah. than dwarf? Well, I have seen the super dwarfs in, let's say, butterfly bush. It's not an edible, but well, they yeah. make super dwarf. They make it well, in blueberries. Yeah. They make it in a blackberry. Not the same. Well, it's not a tree. Yeah, it's true. So it's not. I've seen it in pomegranates. That's a straw man figs. argument. Okay, yeah. All right. <laughs> Trying to help you out of this... Uh, tease moment huh? sorry so, folks anyways grafting and maybe you can touch on this a little bit most of your fruit trees are grafted the good ones onto other roof stock correct yeah, yeah all good fruit trees uh it, we want to take in a field the healthiest brightest strongest sweetest best flavored fruit there is in a field so out of a hundred trees there's one that is over the top We'll take a cutting off of that one, and then we'll graft that one onto a, a, a similar rootstock so that we will get a genetically perfect, exact fruit. Well, this tree will grow just like the, its mother plant mm -hmm. exactly every time. Now, we've not modified the genetics of it. It's the same exact DNA. It grows the exact same fruit, but we can now say every tree that comes off that mother plant will be exactly like this mm -hmm. so preferred we want that now if you grow it from a seed that's another way to do it but now you get all the offspring being all over the place right. it's puny fruits bitter fruits big huge fruits you it's like puppies if you don't you never know, know. <laughs> so it's the only way to get consistency mm -hmm. and then while we're grafting it this mother plant we'll graft it onto a depending on the root that we put it on and how large it is it will dwarf it accordingly mm -hmm. so there's three four different types of root stock that we'll graft onto not only that but we'll take our root stock here we'll go we want we have clay soils mm -hmm. we want a root stock that it gets down to medium size level size and it adapts better to to clay so we have actually specialized fruit trees just for the mountains of Arizona that we sell here not only that but we have fruit trees that are of certain age. So mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're on average seven years old. That's about how old they need to be to start fruiting. Right. So we don't sell whips. We'll hold on to them long enough so that they're old enough to start fruiting. So all of our, they'll fruit right in the tree racks, right yeah. here in the, oh, yeah. in the store. We, we frequently eat, eat the fruit. <laughs> yeah, we do. <laughs> so a couple other things to think about when you're thinking fruit trees, chill hours, get uh, trees that are appropriate chill hours for your area. What does that mean, though? And that's the number, that's the amount of cold days or hours they need before it will trigger them to bloom. Yep, perfect. And good blooms gives you good fruit. So. And the exact temperature is 45 degrees. Uh -huh. 45, every night below 45, mm -hmm. it's every hour it goes. So after about a 1,000 hours, mm -hmm. Macintosh apple will start to fruit. 
And bloom. so it's to bloom, yeah, to yeah. bloom. So anyway, that's so that's important for your area. And then also pollinators. Yeah. Um, some trees need pollinators, and you would, if you have an apple that needs a pollinator, you need another apple, just a different variety, that will pollinate it because it blooms at the same time. Exactly right. And that's one, if you're doing fruit trees, get get some help. Mm-hmm. We've got resources here. We've got experts. That's all they do is fruit trees. Yep. They can help you. But you do want to get it right or you won't get, you have this beautiful tree and it won't fruit. It no blooms fruit. too early. Really be, it's dubious out there. So they'll just sell a fruit tree because it says fruit mm-hmm. and citrus and avocados do not grow in the mountains of Arizona. We'll just end <laughs> on that. Ken and Lisa Lane and the Mountain Gardeners on Fruit Trees in your backyard. Be right back. Look for more tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts through Ken's website. Podcast the show, read his weekly garden column, or follow him on Facebook and Instagram at watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. Hi, Ken with the Plants of the Week and our majestic giant, Pansies. Mammoth blooms smother this 12-inch plant right through winter. Fragrant like its fairy-faced cousin, this giant bloomer has the perfect balance between evergreen foliage and flower brightness. Hardy and carefree, this local pansy brings the garden back to life, all for just $5.99. You'll only find them at Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. Where people who love majestic pansies, they love to shop. Wondering why my garden looks amazing? Well, that's personal. The personal garden shopper service at Waters Garden Center, that is. Before talking with my personal shopper, I had no idea which plants would be best for me. But now my garden is bursting with flowers and buzzing with hummingbirds. Just go to watersgardencenter.com, click on Shop, and choose Personal Garden Shopper. A Waters Garden expert will pick the perfect plants for you, personally. The Personal Garden Shopper, only at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Welcome to the Mountain Gardener with Ken Lane. Gardening in the mountains is different. Listen to Ken's tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts guaranteed to make your gardens more beautiful than ever this year. Now for better advice that works locally, welcome your host, Ken Lane. This week, I have been getting my soils ready to plant. Now, I haven't planted them yet. I've got a couple pansies, that's about it. Uh, But I'm starting. The soil's prepped. The pruning is getting finished. I've fertilized most of my landscapes. Now, generally, I'll tell you to fertilize March 1, fertilize everything in the landscape, but it's been so nice. I was pruning back the mums, the asters, and they were already starting to grow. Things are starting to bloom here at the nursery. So I think, you know, it feels like the season's three, four weeks early, and I had the time, and I had the fertilizer. I just went, I'm going to do it now. And, And really, it doesn't matter as much on the exact timing, You really want to put your plant foods down before, just as that plant is starting to wake up. They're going to be very hungry. All that food that you put down last summer, last fall, that plant has been using that food to form this spring's flower buds, leaf buds, candle growth. So it's used all that food up already to to get ready to burst forth. As it grows, you'll need to replenish that to keep it really healthy. Otherwise, they tend to they they turn to, they turn yellow really fast. So they'll flush out, get nice foliage. You'll get into May or June. All of a sudden, they go yellow on you. If you fertilize them as they're waking up, uh, just just before, just as, you'll keep that foliage going. You'll get better growth. You get longer candle growth on your pine trees. Better flower color. Better fragrance. There's a lot going on for you. So I, it's better to do it at or before, rather than being late to the party. Plants will want to, they will wake up hungry, just like a bear coming out to feast on salmon or, or, or squirrels coming up looking for nuts. They're, they're going to be hungry. Uh, help them if you know that. This is really important for you new folks. If you're new to the area, especially you Midwest folks, you poor, poor folks in the Midwest, you've got topsoils that are... <laughs> four, five, eight feet deep. And so you just hardly ever fertilize. I mean, you think fertilizing thoughts and plants just grow. Here, we we do not have good soil. It's terrible. There's not one redeeming thing about your garden soil unless you've brought it all in from outside sources. And even then, the plants use up that nutrients, the, the compost, the manures, they use it up annually. You need to replenish that. 
And so it's more important than ever for this part of the Southwest to fertilize. You'll be fertilizing more regularly. Just while I'm on that topic, you can go ahead and that box of miracle Grow you brought with you, that's why you moved it here, I don't know. It's just why not keep that in the garage back home uh, where you moved from. But, but if, you, if you have it, use it up. But really, those liquid fertilizers, the ones that you, you, melt, you mix with water and then apply, whether it's Peter's or miracle Grow or whatever, those are not very good sources of food, especially for large, large-rooted things like trees and shrubs, roses. They're better for containers, small things, flowers, tomatoes, that kind of stuff. The reason I don't really care for water solubles, they flush out of the ground so quickly that almost all of it is wasted. And so you're putting this food on. You need to use it like every week to two weeks, uh, very regularly because most of it's flushing out of the soil, not available to the plant. The plant does, it goes through so fast, the plant can't get it all up, especially your larger rooted things. So that food should go out, not at the base of a tree, but out towards those outer branches. And so you're doing, pretty much think of your, your body as the trunk and hold your arms straight out. And those are the branches, especially the lower branches. Of, that's called the drip line of a tree or a shrub. So you want to put most of the food that you're going to apply to a plant to the outer edges of the drip line because that's where the feeder roots are of a plant. These are all small white hairs, very fine roots. Those are the ones that pick up water and food. Towards the trunk, those used to be feeder roots, but now they've turned into really large branches, very, very barky, very substantial. Those plants, those roots underneath that plant, they're just there to anchor it, to keep it, to keep it upright in a windstorm. They've really gotten so much, so barky, they can't take in or absorb little to no nutritional or water value. That's why it's important to fertilize out towards the drip line and to upgrade your water system, especially as the trees mature, to move those drip emitters out further to the middle to outer edges of the drip line. Well, if you're putting a water soluble on and that outer drip line, that's a huge surface of area. It's just really not even efficient to use that much water soluble, especially at the regulation. You want to do it every week to two weeks? That's too laborious and way too expensive. It's really better to use granular foods. And so I, I was throwing out, I used two this week myself. I've got quite a few fruit trees. Here in my, my office studio, got quite a few fruit trees in the back. I use the fruit tree food that I've made years ago. So it's a fruit tree food that's made specifically for things that, that fruit, whether it's a vegetable or, or a fruit tree. Uh, it is the ideal food for those, and it's all natural. It's organic. So I like eating organic foods. And so my herb gardens, the rosemaries, the lavenders, they all got the fruit and berry, fruit and, and vegetable food. For everything else, especially the evergreens, things that summer bloomers, uh, the, the shade trees, everything else got the 744 all-purpose food. Again, it's another food I, I blended together 20 years ago. I mean, it's a recipe I've been tweaking over the last 20 years, and, and plants in, at the higher elevations really, really respond. But these are granular, organic foods. So now you can you can efficiently spread it around the drip line of those plants. And as the plants, it'll break down slowly over a two, three, four month period. We say to reapply it every every three months is ideal. But now you're very efficient. So as that as that plant food breaks down, uh, it actually goes to the soil, and the plant can now absorb all of it instead of just a portion of it. A water-soluble, most of it goes right through the root zone and flushes down into the water table. Organics, they break down slower, and so the plants can feed longer, more consistently, and it's less laborious for you. It's just easier to spread. Do it once, I'm done for three months. Uh, but get done with your pruning. Get done with your... With your cleanup, spray everything with the all-season spray oils and then go ahead and fertilize right afterwards. So that's what I was doing this week in, in my garden. So many of my gardens, the pruning's done. I've sprayed everything as I, as I, as I get done with a section of the, the landscape, I go ahead and hose it down with the, for, with the uh, horticultural oil spray. That's what it is. 
Uh, it's very inexpensive. 20 bucks for a quart. That's, that's inexpensive in my world. There's way more expensive. You get those fancy chemicals. Oh my gosh. The price just goes skyrocketing and it's safe. Uh, it's, it's an oil. So it's as safe as you can get without getting, you know, poisoning yourself, your dogs, the birds, the butterflies. It's safe. It just coats the, the eggs of those insects or any insects that have wintered over with you. And so it takes them out. I did notice in my office, just here in the studio, I did have a huge spider, just a garden spider, coming in to get warm. And I kind of, I went, oh, look, it's warm enough. They're not hybrid. They're actually coming out foraging, looking for things to eat, places to nest where it's warm. And so I gathered them up, her up. I don't know how to tell the sex of a spider and just released them back out. The garden's going to go and be free, but don't come into my house. They're kind of freaky, eight eyes, legs, oh my gosh. But beautiful, what a, what a benefit. It's also an indication that spring is early. It's, I, I'm reading it as three to four weeks. Now, earlier, it's early this year compared to last year. Last year it was late. Remember, it was snowed in February, and it snowed really right through really Memorial Day into May. Things really got off to a late start. Tomatoes, they didn't ripen. Until August, September, October, uh, they just were so, everything was so delayed, it was kind of frustrating. So, but your spring blooming things were spectacular. So the kales and the pansies, the, the Swiss chard, oh, the amount of spinach we got, it was amazing. Because they like that cool, wet snowy, they like bright days and very cold nights. They love that. The flavor comes out. But we had to wait to plant the summer things. So your the crepe myrtles and the uh, the, the roses were delayed. The, the tomatoes went in later. So that's just every year it's different here in the mountains of Arizona. Got a lot in store for you. We got Lisa Waters coming up right after this. You're listening to local garden expert Ken Lane the owner of Waters Garden Center. He can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center, located in Prescott, 1815 Iron Springs Road. Thanks for tuning in to The Mountain Gardener. Hi, Waters with the plants of the week and our Santa Rosa plum. A showy display of white flowers has yielded an abundant harvest of dark crimson fruit. Firm flesh with a wonderful flavor right off the tree or jams. For smaller yards, this is the only plum that produces fruit all by itself. A lovely border tree or garden accent and ready for summer planting at just $49. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love to grow their own plums, they love to shop. Not everyone can grow wildflowers, but we'll make sure you're not one of them. At Waters, we know which wildflowers sprout, thrive, and bloom with success. We're wild about wildflowers with many of our own Arizona blends. Like our Arizona native mix, butterfly and hummingbird mixes, and all are big, bold, and beautiful. At Waters, we know wildflowers, and winter's a season to spread new seed. Waters Garden Center, where people who love their flowers wild, they love to shop for seed. You've tuned in to The Mountain Gardener with local garden expert Ken Lane. Join him each week as he answers timely garden questions that are sure to make a difference in your gardens. Now welcome your host, Ken Lane. Now we have started to fill the garden center up here at Waters Garden Center at least. Again, we're a little bit, we're in this chaparral zone, so that pine, juniper, manzanita level. So we warm up a little bit sooner than, than let's say, Williams or Flagstaff or the White Mountains. And so we're starting early. And, and this season has started early. And so we're bringing in uh, those plants that are dormant. So we want the fruit trees, the lilacs, the spring bloomers to show up before. So they wake up on an hour cycle. And really, you want to put those in the ground if you're thinking about landscaping a new tree or shrub or hedgerow, privacy screen, whatever. If you're thinking about planting a a section of your garden, your landscape, you really want to do it before they wake up. So when they wake up and flush out, they got that beautiful new uh, cherry blossom uh, or or evergreen uh, blocking Arizona cypress. You just want to screen things out. You really want those in the ground so that when they start to elongate, when they start to wake up, when they start to bloom or leaf out, they're in the ground already. That way, 
They wake up and go, whoa, what just happened? Where am I at? This is what I remember. Oh, my God. Last fall, I went dormant, and where am I? You go, oh, well, it must be okay. I've been here. They just wake up in a stupor, go, well, let's just bloom. And then the benefit truly is right after they bloom or they leaf, they start rooting. It's almost like a direct correlation. Bloom, and, and almost immediately it starts to root. You really don't want that to happen at the garden center if you can, especially big trees, it's big shade trees or an aspen or fruit trees, a big lilac bush or butterfly bush. You really want that to, to wake up in, the ground, in your garden so that it's got a larger root mass before the heat of June comes and you're, it'll reduce watering. It'll just, it'll just be easier for you. It'll make it more robust with bugs. There's a lot of benefit to that. We go deep into that um, every week in our garden classes. In fact, I just booked, I've got uh, Johnny's Tree Service, uh, the owners coming in to teach, help teach, and I'm going to teach next week's fruit tree class. This should be good. How to prune fruit trees, what varieties grow well, what bugs to look for, how to get the most out of your trees. We go deep. So we, we have guest speakers come in and share their thoughts. Whatever the expert is in that topic, we bring them in. So every Saturday at 9.30 in the morning, they're free classes here at Waters Garden Center. Please join us. This week, I taught uh, how to prepare your soil. So what, what's the recipe? Here's what you do. Uh, next week, it's fruit trees. We go deep into gardening for newcomers. We'll go, if you want the list, that's heavy materials. Lots of handouts to that one. Ever-blooming evergreens. So blooming evergreens. That's uh, February 22nd. That whole list is up on the web, like everything is watersgardencenter.com. There's a big button at the bottom that says classes. You can't miss it. Hit that and you got the entire series right there available to you. But if you want to get up your game, become a better gardener, uh, look to that. And it's meant to help you be better, be better in the garden this year. And we're hoping that we get some loyalty out of it. So we we make you a better gardener. You want to support us and buy our plants. And there's a lot of benefit to that, but it's really just neighborly. If you help your neighbors garden better, they're going to appreciate you and talk about you. And that formula has worked for us for 58 years. And so we're not going to stop. So we've been holding garden classes every spring for 58 years. They're meant to be really a help to you. And then the garden center, you're starting to see things show up. So it's now time to start shopping, thinking about planning, sketching things out, going, okay, where could I use? Okay, I want a screen. I got a new hot tub. I want to screen things out. My neighbors are bothering me. Oh, I, I want to do this. And so we can help guide you through the best variety or a screening plant for that or new spruce or pine. New Vanderwolf pines came in that are over the top. They're so beautiful. Oh, my gosh. So, and it's okay to start planting now. Well, throughout the week, Lisa and I camp out here at Waters Garden Center. We love helping friends, our neighbors, and fans of the show. Till next week, enjoy this weather Arizona is so famous for. It's almost spring. Time to grow a pear. A pear tree, that is. Late winter is ideal for planting fruit trees. And Waters Garden Center has cherry-picked the hardiest, heaviest producing trees from our most trusted growers. From apples to apricots and persimmons to pears, the garden center is plumb full of varieties that thrive in our mountain soil. And we'll even plant them for you. We believe life is a bowl of cherries, so grow the best ones ever. From Waters Garden Center in Prescott. If you want a more fruitful garden, increase success in your landscape that just feels better, then tune in every week to The Mountain Gardener. Years of tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts are guaranteed to make your gardens nicer than ever. Listen to this podcast or read Ken's weekly garden column by visiting watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. Thanks for tuning in.